Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's all rise and worship the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ.
Yeah. 
and humbled we are to be owned by the one true great God of the universe. We thank you, Lord, for your keeping power. We thank you that we are your children today, that you gave everything for each one of us so we could live with a hope of life eternal. 
and the presence of your spirit to lead and guide us each day. How grateful we are to be yours, Lord. Lead and guide us now as we study your word. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Greet someone in that awesome love of Jesus today. over there. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. Happy Mother's Day to you moms and moms-to-be. We want to look at uh, the first chapter of 1 Samuel today. I want to look at the life of a, uh, a lady who so longed and yearned to be a mom. And we certainly appreciate our moms, their investment, their love, their encouragement. Thank God for the feminine gender. <laughs> One of two. Now there was a certain man of Ramatham Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, son of Tohu, and Zoph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, the name of the one was Hannah. The name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of or the priests of the Lord were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her, provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, and therefore she wept and did not eat. And then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And so Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. And now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. And now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard, and therefore Eli thought she was drunk. And so Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. And then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your, pet your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And so the woman went her way and ate. 
and her face was no longer sad. And then they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to the house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, or Hannah, his wife, rather, and the Lord remembered her. And it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, and saying, Because I have asked him from the Lord, and now the man, Elkanah, and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that, that uh, he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. And so Elkanah, her husband, said to her, uh, Do what seems good to you or best to you, and wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. And then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. And now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, and with three bulls and one ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And then they slaughtered the bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I have asked of him. Therefore I have also lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He shall be lent to the Lord. And so they worshiped the Lord there. And with that, let's pray. Lord, uh, we are so, you have so blessed humanity with godly women. Lord, over the course of history, there have been so many godly women. And Lord, uh, the impact of their lives and ministry has been felt, Lord, in nations and cultures. And Lord, we want to thank you, Father, for the godly women that you've placed into our lives. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon them. Lord, encourage, we pray, those mothers, Lord, that have served you faithfully, those mothers, Lord, that perhaps may be hearts are maybe wounded because of a prodigal, Lord, or maybe because of the loss of a dear son. Lord, how we pray that you might just Fill that void, Lord, we pray, and, and bring encouragement. And Lord, we pray, as there's many mothers to be, that you would encourage these dear women, that you would help them as they seek to raise up a godly seed. And Lord, how we pray today in our nation, Lord, when uh, unfortunately, Lord, uh, as we, this very week, Lord, the issue of abortion has come front and center when so many children, Lord, have been lost. Lord, how we pray. We pray for the mothers of our nation. Pray for the women of this nation, that you would be working, Lord, in their hearts and in their lives. Lord, how we pray and thank you for the revelation of your truth, that, Lord, you're the one who has given, Lord, uh, women this great privilege and honor to have a child, and to bless, Lord, we pray, the culture and the society. So, Father, we thank you for this day. And, Lord, as we, Lord, uh, gather around your word this morning, Lord, how we pray that you would speak, Lord, in a fresh way, Lord, to our hearts and lives. For, Lord, we bless and thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You know, why is it that when you want to do something good, there always seems like there's some kind of hindrance or some kind of roadblock. And I think we're reminded of that once again uh, as we see this whole uh, issue of abortion come to the forefront um, and uh, the, the opponents, the, the adversaries to that. And yet we look at it in a sense, in a personal kind of way, we look at this story here of a woman who very simply, she just wanted a child, you know, wanted something good. And why is it that you, you see so many times, so many instances in the scripture uh, even in these patriarchal families, there, there seemed to be uh, the mother, you know, the, the wife, that is, that you know, she couldn't have children. And it was only as perhaps maybe she cried out to the Lord for intervention and for mercy uh, did God just, enter, you know, just intervene and, and work his wonderful purpose. And we see it here. You know, this story here is framed for us at a time of great spiritual defeat and decline, you know, for the people of Israel. 
you know, the nation at this point had been pretty much corrupt right from the top into the bottom. We see that as the story sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know un unfolds. Uh, the people were depressed. They were very demoralized about what was going on within their nation, within their country. And in, into this particular scene, God brings, you know, his blessing. He, uh, and, and the funny thing is, you know, so often we pray for solution and resolution, you know, in our culture and our society. And so often God sends it. By, by giving a child, you know, by, by sending a person into the situation. And God's going to use that person. But before he uses that person, really, in a sense, it starts here with a mother. It starts here with a woman who was basically barren, uh, just crying out for God's help and God's intervention and God's mercy. And, uh, and again, as we, you know, the nation had become so absolutely decadent at this particular point. This is the time of the judges. And... Uh, I think there's a verse there that sums up, you know, that entire uh, period in, in Jewish history is that every man did what was right in his own eyes. Kind of think we've gotten back to that again, haven't we? Uh, where there's a casting off of all kinds of, you know, restraint and authority, uh, and everybody wants to do what they deem to be right in their own eyes. Well, this is the time frame, you know, that we find in the Bible in which we, uh, you know, this story is framed um, you know, in a similar way, God gave England a woman by the name of Susanna Wesley. She was married to a preacher, and she had 19 children. And, uh, and of her 19 children, uh, the two that we know about is John and Charles. And uh, they were basically the, you know, they were the guys who birthed, you know, what was called the, 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 the Wesleyan, because of their name was Wesley, uh, the Methodist, uh, you know, movement and so forth. Um, and, uh, and, you know, when you look at that particular time back in the 1700s to 18th century there, it was a terrible time. Uh, both of the children almost died. Uh, John almost died in a fire, and uh, uh, his, his, some couple guys uh, uh, basically rescued him. Uh, Charles was born prematurely, um, several weeks uh, ahead of his term, and they said that on the day that basically he was... Um, supposed to be born is the day that all of a sudden, you know, he started crying and <laughs> sort of came to life. Kind of, they were going to wonder if he even lived. But it was interesting that, as, you know, the prayers of this godly mother, these two men became men of destiny. Uh, John Phillips, the author John Phillips, tells an interesting story. He gives us a little insight about that particular time. He says, historians agree that conditions were never darker in England than they were prior to the coming of the Wesleyan revival. The theater, the, other, the entertainment was so incredibly decadent. The royal court and the castles of the nobility reeked with licentiousness. The people scorned religion and devoured atheistic writings of Hume and Gibbon uh, and Voltaire. Drunkenness was widespread. And in 1736, just three years before that revival began, every sixth house, sixth house in London was a gin mill. The signboards of the public houses, and that's what they call them, public houses. And if you guys remember Steve Saint being here, uh, you know, just a month or two ago, uh, their ministry center was an old public house. It was a, it was a, it was a tavern, and uh, they tell the story oftentimes people, you know, have been to that tavern years, they come back to visit it, thinking it's still, a, a, you know, a bar, and they come in and they get served with something a little bit different than uh, the drink that they thought they were going to get. Uh, the signboards on these public houses advertised that they would make a man drunk for a penny and dead drunk for two pennies. They would also provide a free bed on which the man could sleep off his stupor, and in the morning he would be given a dram of gin, which would ease his hangover. And from these establishments, gangs of thieves sallied forth to outright outrage the community and kill, maim, torture, and perform all kinds of violent atrocities. The universities and colleges seethed with atheism and radical philosophies. The priests of the Anglican Church were, for the most part, worldly men. Uh, Augustus Toplady, who wrote the hymn Rock of Ages, said that, a converted, that of a converted Anglican minister, that it was, he was a great wonder as if it was a comet. The Bishop of Litchfield said, The Lord's Day is now the devil's market day. More lewdness, more drunkenness, more quarrels and murders, more sin is contrived and committed on this day than all the other days of the week combined. Rampant immorality was openly defended and justified. Virtually every kind of sin found a writer to teach it and a bookseller to spread it. 
Bishop Butler said that it was taken for granted that Christianity was no longer even a subject for uh, inquiry. England in the 18th century sorely needed revival, just as Israel needed revival in the 12th century um, B.C. God sent England a Susan Wesley, and Israel he sent a Hannah. Would that today he would send America and England another Hannah or Susanna? And how true that is. You know, when you read that about England, kind of like, uh, gee whiz, uh, kind of sounds like what's going on, you know, in our country today. And how we need a revival. And Israel of old needed that, you know, that for God to pour out his spirit. But first there would be a person who would pour out their heart and pour out their life. And uh, I want to consider her life in basically four stages. And, and the first one is her barrenness. You know, sometimes the things that, you know, just um, that we so abhor are the very things that God uses in our lives to bring us to him. And for Hannah, it was basically her, her barrenness and the fact that she had been uh, basically maligned and, and provoked, you know, by uh, another woman, another wife uh, in the house. Picking it up in verse 4, uh, this woman's name was Penina. And, and, and sometimes it seems like a, a great enigma, doesn't it? You know, sometimes it seems like the wicked are flourishing and the, and the righteous are struggling, you know, sometimes just to make ends meet. Uh, and here is Penina. She's kind of a nasty gal. Um, and, uh, you know, she's somewhat spiteful even to the fact that uh, uh, she's so, you know, in a sense probably jealous, you know, of, of Hannah. And uh, we see Hannah in verse 5. But Penina has all these sons, all these daughters. Now, God's blessed her. God, God has blessed her in a wonderful way. And uh, uh, it said, but to Hannah he gave a double portion, for he loved Hannah. In other words, you know, as, as it says, the Lord closed the room. She, you know, she was childless, but, you know, her name means graceful. And, and, you know, I think sometimes it's the very thing that we don't like in our life that, it, that, that just sort of opens our life up to the Lord and his grace comes into us and through us. And it kind of wonderfully, you, you'll notice sometimes some of the most graceful, sweet people are the people that have suffered, that they've gone through difficult things. And, uh, and, and when we think about suffering, it's something that, in a sense, none of us like, but how God uses it. He, he uses, you know, the, whether it's an emotional pain or even a physical suffering or some kind of rejection. God can use those things um, to draw near to us that we might cleave to him. I, I, I notice, you know, in, it's just human nature. Sometimes it takes some great pain or loss in our life to really bring us closer. You know, we can, we can know the Lord. We can know him. We can appreciate him. We can love him. But sometimes these, these, these things take place in our life that they really draw us closer to the Lord. Because sometimes we think, you know, sometimes I think maybe we're just sort of okay with, you know, where I am with the Lord. But he's always wanted to draw us closer. And he uses those particular things as we maybe go through those uh, painful things in our life, you know, suffering and so forth. And we see that here once again in this particular story. We're told in verse 6 that her rival had provoked her severely. And how difficult that must have been. What a, you know, what a difficult thing, you know, to, to live in the same home with someone who's spiteful and kind of a vindictive. You've ever been around a vindictive person? Oh, it's so, it's, it's so difficult to be around that kind of person, um, you know, as they, you know, are attacking continually, constantly, trying to hurt other people. And, and we're told here in verse 7, this went on year by year. Uh, how many years, we don't know exactly. Um, and again, a, a trial. Imagine a trial going on, a very severe trial going on in someone's life, in your life, in my life, you know, for a, for, you know, for a, a, a long period of time. But this was a catalyst. This was the very thing that God was going to use to bring blessing not only to this person, but he was also too going to use it to bring blessing to other people. And not just a small group of people. He was going to use this trial in her life to bring blessing to the entire nation. You know, sometimes we don't realize that when we're going through something, when we're going through a trial, and how when we get through that trial and, and we move through that trial and, and we're trusting God, that he can wonderfully take that trial and, and he can make it, in a sense, into a ministry. 
He can bring blessing into the lives of, of other people. And we see that here once again in this particular story. And, um, you know, polygamy is something that the Bible reveals that it just doesn't work. Uh, polygamy, I think, is the, the, the brainchild of lustful men. Uh, who, who, and, and the funny thing is, uh, when you look at it's not it's not really uh, encouraged um, or endorsed in the Bible. When you look at Genesis chapter two verse twenty four, it's basically one man, one woman, and uh, that's always the way it's been. But sometimes we look at this, you know, these kind of situations, and you notice a lot of situations, whether it's polygamy um, or whether it's some other vice or some other situation like that. Um, and, and one of the things that we realize when we look at the Bible and look at the things that go on in humanity is that legislating a law isn't going to change people. We see that in our world, in our culture. Uh, if that was true, all we'd need is the law of Moses, okay? That's all we would need. We wouldn't need a savior. We wouldn't need any other, you know, any other kind of instrument or help. It would just basically because the problem is, is the hearts of human beings that were wayward. There's a rebellion in the heart. And yet we see what happens, like, for instance, with polygamy, e even slavery, um, you know, all kinds of other activities that take place. Um, and, and, and people say, well, you know what, uh, you know, why did God allow that? Why did God permit that? You see, that's the, that's the thing. He permits you and I to make choices, okay? Yes, there is such a thing as self-will and human will. Uh, and, and God, he works, you know, he works, that's why when you look at so many of the patriarchal families, uh, there are more than one wife. And, and, and the Bible is faithful, God is faithful to reveal, you know, the difficulties and the problems, you know, when there is polygamy, um, you know, the, the, ri the rivalry that would take place, you know, in that, f in that home and so forth. And what we find is when we, you know, when we look to God and God begins, that's why when you look at things like polygamy, even things like slavery, eventually God working in the heart. Again, not just legislating a law. That's why, you know, politicians think, well, if we just legislate a new law, it's going to change everything. No, it isn't. Because only God can change the heart. Only God works at that, you know, that interior ministry you know, deep within our hearts, deep within our lives. And look at your own life. Look at your own life, and in certain areas, how long it's taken for the Lord to change you. Has there maybe been some issue in your life? Maybe more than one, but at least some issue that, that uh, you know, it's been an issue in your life, your whole, your whole redeemed life. It's not, it doesn't have the power over you like it used to, but there can be that tendency, that, that tendency to just resort you know, to that old way of handling things and whatever the case may be. And, and what we see in that is the incredible, amazing patience of God working in us, refining us, sanctifying, changing us. Whereas at one point, you know, outside of Christ or before Christ, you know, it's like we didn't care. Okay, that's just the way I am, you know, kind of a thing. And the Spirit of God comes in and begins to change us, and all of a sudden we begin to grieve begin to grieve about maybe certain some area in my life. And, and sometimes we don't grieve so much until it comes out maybe and hurts somebody else. It, it offends or it hurts somebody else, and all of a sudden we see the pain. And, and the Spirit of God, you know, works in us, and, and, and he wants to, you know, bring transition. He wants to bring change, you know, within our life and within our, you know, our particular situation. So, again, here this thing, this thing of uh, polygamy. Uh, and, you know, it's a, there's, there's nations today, there's several Islamic nations uh, that you're allowed to have up to four wives. I don't know why they cut it off at four. <laughs> it's like, a, what's wrong with five? Uh, you know, you, I guess, uh, qua, what's a quadruple trouble is enough, right? Uh, when you, uh, you take on uh, that, that kind of a, uh, you know, situation. And again, what it is, you see it in cultures where just men are lustful. Men are lustful, and, you know, I always... Uh, you know, you look at David, and, and, and Dave, you know, David was absolutely trumped by his son Solomon. I think David had somewhere between 12 and 16 wives. It's hard to kind of, hard to actually kind of piece that together when you look at the Scripture, but he had a bunch of them. He at least, I think he at least had a dozen wives. And, of course, he was trumped by uh, uh, his son Solomon, a thousand wives. I mean, you talk about absolute insanity, 
Uh, and again, it creates, and, and the Bible says eventually, and you look at Solomon in the beginning, great heart for God. And what did it say? His wives. His wives stole his heart from the Lord. And that can happen. That does happen. And it happens when we move away from God's plan, you know, God's purpose. So again, these things become somewhat of a, a catalyst. And we find in verse 7, here is Hannah just, just weeping. And I think it's probably many times she's wept. You know, there's a, isn't there a certain therapy in tears? I don't know if you're a crier. Uh, maybe you're a public crier, okay? I'm not a public crier. I have to be alone to cry. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's a pride thing, okay, I, I admit it, but I just don't like to, but I, don't, I really don't cry that often. I really, um, you know, I, I, we have, you know, brothers uh, in our prayer meetings that, that oftentimes weep, and, and it's because obviously they have a, a really tender heart, uh, but there is, there's a certain therapy that, that comes to us. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, it said that, uh, uh, you know, the, the tears were, you know, when you, when you when you lost a loved one, you, you just, you know, you, you try to catch your tears and put them into a little bottle, uh, just signifying your grief and your sorrow over the loss of that particular person. And, and again, God sees all our tears, doesn't he? he? He sees the weeping, he sees the brokenness, he sees. And some of, some of those times, I think, you know, you know, when we're broken in that kind of a way, um, we really have meetings with God that, uh, that just, they, they seem to be uh, such a special kind of moment where we just sort of interface, you know, heart to heart, you know, with the Lord. I've, I've had those, and I, I find they're so, I appreciate them so much. And, and even though she's being provoked, the thing that you see, you know, this gracious woman, Hannah, she's not provoking back. That, that's always uh, an indication you know, of a heart that's been changed by God, not to respond in kind, not to, you know, revile when you've been reviled. And, and that takes grace, doesn't it? That does take grace, the grace of God, not to respond in kind to those perhaps who may be um, provoking us in some kind of way. Now, as we come to verse 9, here we see her bitterness and her brokenness. Now, she stopped, she was, wasn't eating, and of course, there is a time to fast. Sometimes you may find the Lord just prompting you, leading you to a time of just maybe fasting and prayer about a certain kind of issue that has just sort of dominated your thinking, maybe some painful issue in your life. And I would encourage you, if the Holy Spirit is prompting you to seek him in that kind of way where you're so serious. In other words, you're not gaining merits by not eating, but you're so serious about this issue in your heart and in your prayers and you're crying out to him that you're just going to set aside your meal. You're going to set aside your meal. You're going to fast. And remember, I always remember what Jesus said, this kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. There are certain entrenched demonic activities that are at work against the people of God. And sometimes they just won't stop until we pray, until we fast. And maybe when there's something like that, in your life that you need to set that time aside. I would encourage you to do that. Um, I, I don't fast as much as I used to. I used to fast a lot. It's, kind of, it's really more difficult for me uh, because of diabetes. Um, but uh, for years and years, Margie and I would fast on a, on a regular basis, and I have seen a great benefit in it. As a matter of fact, I do fast now, but it's an intermittent, intermittent kind of a fasting uh, that I do because that's about all I can kind of handle. But anyway here, uh, Hannah rose, we're told, <clears throat> uh, after they were finished eating and drinking. They're in Shiloh. The, the, the um, center of worship is not in Jerusalem yet. It's in Shiloh. It's, uh, the the uh, Ark of God is in a tent at this particular point very early on in the history of God's people. And uh, we're told very simply, uh, she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And, you know, prayer is always a good antidote when we're going through some kind of painful thing. To look first, you know, just to, just to turn to him, you know, in prayer and just to seek him. And, to, you know, just simply to pour out your situation, you know, before the Lord. And, and as she comes here to Eli, this guy is so absolutely out of touch with God. 
And if you read the story, you know the story about Eli and his sons. It would, the, the, the worship was an absolute mess. Judgment would come to that priestly family. But we find in verse 11, she makes a vow. In other words, she makes a promise. She meant it. And she was going to keep it, and she did keep it. She made a vow. And here's what she said, O Lord of hosts, Lord of armies. That's what that means. <laughs> You're the Lord of armies. And if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but give, will give your maidservant a male child. Very specific there. And then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. In other words, she's dedicating him before, she, before he is even in the womb. She is dedicating him to a Nazarite life. <laughs> Not just a Nazarite vow, but a Nazarite life. And unknowingly to her, you know, her prayer here is the answer to national apostasy. She doesn't even fully realize it. She's asking for a deliverer. And sometimes when we pray, when we're in that kind of condition. It's as if God puts the prayer in our hearts. You ever have the Lord put a prayer in your heart? It's just like it just sort of bubbled out. And it's like you knew that you knew that. Well, I didn't come to this prayer time with that prayer on my mind or on my list, but as it came out, it crossed your very lips. You were impressed by it because it was a spirit of God just sort of prompting you, putting that prayer, and sometimes he will do that. He'll put that very prayer in our heart, and we, even as we just begin to pray, we're not even sure what exactly we're praying, but all of a sudden it just sort of it percolates and comes out because it's what God wants to do. Do you ever find yourself praying about something and for something that you didn't necessarily want? Maybe praying in sort of a sacrificial kind of a way. Man, that's the work of the Spirit of God within our hearts, within our lives, prompting us, leading us, guiding us. And that's why, you know what, we need to be a people of prayer. Jesus said, my, my house will be a house of prayer. His church will be a house of prayer. It's become, for the most part, a house of preaching. <laughs> and not that that's wrong. But equally, it needs to be a house of prayer. And that's our lives. Are we praying? So many needs around us. And, the, you know, the Lord uses our troubles so oftentimes to bring blessing to other people. It happened, she continued praying before the Lord, and Eli watched her mouth. And Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. You see, Eli failed her, but God did not. How sad when a person comes to the church for counsel and for guidance and doesn't get it. This guy, again, he's the priest, he's the high priest, he is so out of touch with the Lord. And you know, she's, and here's the, here's the beautiful truth. God hears the prayer when you're just, it's just a whisper. She's, uh, it kind of speaks in a sense of, of what this man and what he dealt with within the culture so often that he just assumed, well, she's drunk. What's she, what's she doing here, drunk? But she wasn't. She's brokenhearted, pouring out her heart before the Lord. He says, how long will you be drunk? Put, put your wine away from you. This guy's got no discernment, no sensitivity to the fact that, man, she is a wounded soul. Oh, Lord, give us discernment. 
One of the things that we pray oftentimes as we meet is, is we pray for this. We pray for body ministry, that we're ministering one to another. Sharing and caring, praying for one another, recognizing, A, when someone else is struggling and going through something, that that's something that anybody in church leadership has to, has to be doing that. Because the Bible refers to anybody in church leadership as an overseer. In other words, they're overseeing the flock and, and looking for those who are maybe hurting for, for a particular need. And how can I reach out? How can I help someone? Body ministry is so important. That's why I love to see folks that sort of linger for a while and converse. Because sometimes it takes a while, doesn't it, before think the issues come out? Before we would perhaps maybe feel like we're in a safe, secure kind of a conversation where we can just sort of open our hearts and open our lives. Say, yeah, you know, I really, you know, I'm struggling with this or with that. Can, you know, can, 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 can you guys pray for me or can you pray for me, whatever the case may be? And sometimes it'll, you know, it'll open up that opportunity maybe to counsel. The church is God's original therapy group. That's why we need one another. And in opening our lives up, that the gift, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are at work within us. Now, next in verse 15, we, we see her, her breakthrough. And in spite of everyone misunderstanding and maligning her, uh, she has laid out her situation before the Lord. And here's what she said um, to, uh, to Eli. No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my heart before the Lord. And again, you know, at times, you know, we can look to people, you know, for some kind of resolution and get none. But have we made our case to the Lord? Have we looked to the Lord? Have we poured out our circumstance, our situation? That's why the Bible's always saying Old Testament new, but Jesus sort of frames it wonderfully in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, when he says, Come unto me, all you that labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and you will find rest for your soul. Yeah, we come to one another, we, we minister to one another, but first and foremost, we come to the Lord. You know, David speaks about that in one of his psalms, how he poured out his heart before the Lord. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just had that kind of an opportunity where you just sort of, you poured it out? You, you poured, because a lot of times we pour it out before people. I think it happens every night in, in bar rooms, Okay? All kinds of things are poured out. No resolution. But you know what? When you pour it out before the Lord, pour out your case, your story, your situation, your pain. And I think in a sense, she, she really comes in faith and prayer and, and releases it before the Lord. She, she, this, I, this perhaps maybe might be the very first time she's ever really done that, just pouring out her burden, her situation before the Lord. And again, she, she's, she's promised and committed herself to raising this child, uh, investing in his life, you know, godly values. And, and, and think about this. In that culture... A child was weaned. That means they were fully trained around five years old. Can you imagine that? Any of us that have that's had kids? That, you, that, you could, that, that a child at five years old could be so fully trained that you could take him somewhere and leave him there? I imagine in most cases, you know, Eli would have been on the phone, you know, come and get your kid. He's screaming. He's been screaming for the last five days. We don't know what to do with him. He's, been, he's thrown himself on the floor, and he's flailing and kicking his legs. Please come and take him. But, I mean, when you think about the sacrifice, though, of this, of this woman, 
to come and, and to offer up her son. Now, maybe we're not called to do it like that, but we do need to offer up our children, don't we? We do need to invest in them and commit ourselves to them in, in every way possible. You know, so often I think, um, as I talk to parents, there are um, so many of us that have prodigals and our children are not where we want them to be. But you know what? It's never too late to pray. Never too late to trust God. He's, he's the God of the impossible. He's a God who works in situations and circumstances that maybe we can't change. But as we give them to him, as we entrust them to him, can you imagine, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're sometimes uh, when you think about how we have to give up our children when they get to a certain age, 18, or whatever the case may be, and we kind of worry about them and that sort of thing. What it must have been like for Hannah? What's he, five? Maybe, maybe five? Let's, let's maybe even be a little more um, conservative. Uh, seven years old, but he's very young. To leave him in that situation. And with the reputation of Hophni and Phineas. I mean, to leave your child in a good situation is one thing. But it speaks of her faith of her trust that, that God is going to take care. And I would imagine, probably if anything, the fires of prayer in her heart and in her life. They probably burned very brightly. I think even sometimes when our children are adults, whether they're on track or not, they need our prayers. They need our prayers. You know, I think when it comes to spiritual investment in people's lives, we don't know perhaps maybe who may be praying for us. We don't know oftentimes or really recognize or maybe even thankful for the shoulders of people that we stand on. But I believe when we get into eternity, we'll be able to access all that. We'll, we'll, we'll know We'll know all those things. And don't undercut the power of prayer. Because maybe the situation looks incorrigible. To keep praying, to keep seeking the Lord, to keep crying out for his his help, his intervention. So I think it was a very sacrificial thing for her to give up. Her little boy, at this point, not knowing she was going to have other children, which she did, but at this point, again, just to, that was my promise. I committed myself. God gave me that child, and I'm going to give him back to the Lord. And again, in verse 17, <laughs> Here's the fourth thing, her blessedness, how God honored her faith, answered her prayer. And Eli said, and, and again here, in spite of, you know, God spoke through this man in spite of his failures. You know why? God loves his people. The Lord loves his people. And even though this guy was off track and insensitive and everything could possibly be wrong, God saw her need. God loved her. God's going to answer her prayer. He's going to speak here through Eli. And he says, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And so the woman went her way, and she ate. And her face was no longer sad. 
So all the doubt, all the sadness, the bitterness is gone. You know why? She took God at his word. That's all she had. That was all she had. All she had was God's word and God's truth, and she simply took God at his word. And her face told the whole story. Just her countenance. All of a sudden, you know, the, the joy of the Lord. And there's something about, you know, when, when we pray and we're trusting him, that there's that witness of the Spirit of God in our life, that all of a sudden there's just a, there's a, uh, there's just a sense, a peace, and a, a rest, a trust, a joy that begins to well up into our hearts and into our lives. That's happened for Hannah. As a matter of fact, we won't look at that, but chapter 2 is her whole song. I tell you what, you've got to be happy to write a song unless you're writing a funeral dirge, okay? You've got to be happy. You've got to be joyful. Kind of, it's kind of like, almost like Mary, right? Mary's song, Mary's Magnificat uh, over there. I think it's, it's in Luke chapter 2, I think it is. Just, just a, a song of praise and thanks. God, you are so good. Because you know as well as I do, it's hard, to, it's hard to sing, isn't it, when you're struggling, when you're in a difficult place. And all of a sudden, God has spoken to her heart. you got nothing else. you got nothing else at all. You might have to go back home and still be provoked by Penina. But you know, when God speaks to your heart, the doubts can go too. There can be just a, a peace and a realization. Man, God has spoken. I don't know when he's going to do it, but I know he's going to do it. I think, that was her, I think that was her story, her case. It, it reminds me of Psalm 126 where it says, uh, you know, first she comes weeping and now she returns rejoicing, bringing her sheaves with her. Looking at verse 26, she returns now. This is probably several years later. Because as she was weaning him, she wasn't going to go up to the temple with that little one until it was time to just give him to the Lord and trust him to the Lord. And here she is, years later, with Eli. Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here uh, before you here praying to the Lord, so identifying herself. And for this child I prayed. And the Lord granted me my petition, which I've asked of him. And again, simply she is declaring, God, you are so good. But also, too, there's a blessing that's going to take place in the nation. She doesn't realize that yet. Because you know what? Sam was just a little boy. But he's going to grow up to be a great man of God. And the impact of his life is going to turn the course of that nation. You know, again, it's interesting when you look at how God can just take a life. Just a simple life that is just turned over to him and committed to him. I can remember uh, Pastor Chuck saying, he didn't find this out till after he was born, obviously, but how his mother would just talk to him and pray for him when he was in the womb. Isn't that great? God honors when we submit and commit ourselves, turn over our lives, turn over, turn over our families, turn over our relationships. No family's perfect. You know, even as God's people, we have our struggles. We have our battles. We have our losses. But also, to praise God, we have our victories. God is faithful. No matter what it is that you and I have to nav navigate through, that he has promised that he will be with us. You know, sometimes when we read these stories, we, of course, we 
oftentimes insert ourselves into them. But sometimes our stories are a lot different, aren't they? Than the stories that we read in the Bible. They're not always a, a good outcome. Sometimes they're painful. Sometimes it's a great loss. But you see, our God is faithful and he loves us. No matter what it is, whatever pain, whatever suffering, whatever issue it is that we might have to deal with, that we're not alone, that, that he is there for us. And he will be with us. And no matter what, maybe perhaps loss or failure we may have had, as we look to him afresh, as we pray, God is the God who can bring reversals. He can bring change. He's the God of, who can bring transformation and transition. So if you're a parent or a mom, and maybe there's some situations that are maybe not looking too good in your life, I want to encourage you to trust him. And to look to him, because he's the God who can, he's the God of miracles. And the whole nation here was going down the tubes. And everything looked forlorn. But here was a woman crying out to God. And God gave her not only the answer for her prayers, but an answer to the problems of the entire nation. Therefore, also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He shall be lent to the Lord, so they worship the Lord there. And so how, no doubt, she loved this boy. But in love, you know what? She gave him back to God. And that's something, too, that we need to do that. We do that, in a sense, when we dedicate our children, don't we? But you know something? Sometimes we can dedicate them but hold on to them a little too tightly. We need, to really, we need to really turn them over to the Lord for him to work in those situations. So, Lord, we praise you today. And, Father, we ask your blessing upon the dear women in our lives that are mothers. Lord, uh, we think of their, their commitment, their sacrifice. We think of their love. And Lord, we also too think of the pain that many mothers will experience. Lord, there can be losses. There can be rejection uh, from a spouse. So Father, we want to pray and lift these dear ladies before you. May you encourage them, Father. May you strengthen them. May you just help them. Lord, like we see with Hannah, Lord, as she poured out her heart to you, Lord, you filled her heart. You filled her heart. You healed her wounded spirit. And Lord, you gave her a glorious promise and blessing for the future. And so we pray that you do that. Again, we thank you for these dear and precious ladies. And Lord, the, the moms-to-be, Lord, help them. And Lord, may the older ladies, Lord, who have um, Lord raised up their families, Lord, help them to reach out and to mentor, Lord, these, these young gals. Lord, uh, with all the struggles, with all of the, the difficulties, Lord, of this culture, Lord, help us, we pray, to glorify and to honor you. For Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we rise?
God bless you all. Have a beautiful day in Jesus.